Uh, the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion number 195 in the name of Liz Smith on accessible hospital transport in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I remind people in the gallery the Parliament is still in session and this is a debate proceeding. Could I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now? I repeat, can I ask people in the gallery to leave quietly in respect to the members taking part in the debate? I call Liz Smith to open the debate. Ms Smith, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, as we have seen with uh, projects such as the New Fort Bridge or the uh, Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Programme, securing Scotland's transport infrastructure is essential for our country's future. However, for many Scots, it is not just the big projects that are important to them, but their local bus routes too, and especially those which provide vital links to hospitals and to medical clinics. These bus services are essential to the quality of life, the physical and mental health of patients, and of course, to their family. Indeed, without them, many Scottish communities would struggle, especially in an age when there is so much pressure to merge acute services. The situation was made plain in a letter from one of my constituents. Due to complications from recent surgery, this lady is required to travel from Perth Royal Infirmary to Ninewells Hospital in Dundee on a very regular basis. In the past, she would have used the 333 service. However, since the withdrawal of that route in November 2014, Stagecoach East Scotland has extended an existing coach route, the X7 service that runs from Aberdeen to Dundee to Ninewells and now on to PRI. Although Stagecoach is offering a new coach, which in some instances provides a higher quality of service, for many people with mobility issues, such as my constituent, it is leaving them behind. For example, there are only two seats on the downstairs bit of the coach, both of which are often in use by other passengers. As she suffers from chronic arthritis, my constituent struggles to climb the stairs, and she claims that the driver is not in a position to help her with the I'm sorry, Ms Smith, I, I'm going to say this again. I cannot hear the member speaking because of the noise from the gallery. Sorry, Ms Smith, please right. go ahead. That's okay. Uh, now, I know that my uh, colleague, uh, Alexander Stewart, will say more in, in his own contribution because he's uh, been on this case for uh, some time, uh, as have other uh, councillors across the political spectrum. Um, but people who do have visual impairment or those recovering from orthopaedic injuries, those with heart conditions, or simply people who find it difficult to negotiate the stairs on a moving bus, is a very genuine concern that the buses are badly designed for the hospital link route. On top of this, the new 750,000 coach is unable to turn properly in Perth Royal Infirmary as a turning circle that was designed for the buses uh, were those that were in use for the old 333. Stagecoach offers a low floor alternative in the 16 bus. However, this bus takes one hour and 13 minutes in comparison to the 45 minute journey provided by the X7. So for someone as my constituent, who has been on obviously a very difficult road with her treatment, then it is a, a very difficult situation indeed. However, the story of that constituent is not just a single case, because there are dozens of similar stories from across Scotland. In August of this year, there were other problems for five passengers after the changes to the 77 service between Goldray and Ninewells Hospital. The alternative service, which will terminate at Dundee bus station rather than Ninewells, mm -hmm. is forcing passengers to change buses, and it's been branded awful by some of the local councillors. It's prompted a raft of complaints from constituents and indeed from many in the medical profession. The X42 route connecting Cooper and Ninewells is also under threat, with a proposed alternative service also terminating at Dundee bus station. In Glasgow too, we have seen the closure of the G1 and G2 bus services from Maryhill to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in March. In Falkirk, the first bus services X86 and 24, which provide vital access to the Forth Valley Royal Hospital for local residents, have also been cut, leading community council members to label the cuts completely unacceptable and directly affecting the elderly, infirm and those who do not have a car. In the borders, the council funded 71 route from Hoyt to the Borders General Hospital was cut in July 2014, leaving Hoyt residents without a direct bus to their nearest major hospital. In Aberdeen, First Group have threatened to end the X40 and 11 services from Kingswells to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, a move which local people there claim will leave residents of the suburb without access to their hospital and causing them to miss important medical appointments. 
When these cases are put alongside each other, there is a worrying picture of Scotland, one where communities, in particular older people, are feeling abandoned by transport providers and cut off from very essential services. Whilst it's heartening to see in some local areas that there have been sub-subsidised bus services for older and infirm residents now being offered by Transport Scotland, an excellent example, of course, is that uh, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport. There are a large number of our elderly and infirm who face routine trips to visit their GP who are experiencing daunting and exhausting trips on buses. A weekly check-up can become a four-hour odyssey requiring multiple changes at different bus stations. For older residents, this can prove far too much particularly at times of distress, sometimes of bereavement, and of course in poor weather. Nor is this an issue just limited to the elderly. Known drivers face equally challenging experiences to get to and from hospital. Centralisation has meant that many hospital appointments no longer take place in local hospitals. So this results in longer and more costly journeys being required. It's often difficult for people to get a bus from outlying places to get to the hospital. And it's in many cases impossible to visit inpatients in the evenings and that makes the bus companies put in a very difficult position. For example, the first bus to Livingston from Deferman leaves at 9 a.m. and the last one back is not till 5.40 in the evening. Presiding officer, buses are a lifeline for rural communities and I think there's a common agreement across this parliament that there needs to be increased support for community schemes by extending the free bus pass scheme to community transport. Otherwise, far too many people become victims of a very patchy national strategy which means that access to local hospitals is even more difficult for those in need. This is not a party political issue, but I do hope the Scottish ministers will give this a lot of consideration and I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much and well done, Ms Smith, for persisting. We will deal with this on another occasion. It's not fair to members. I call Foot McGregor, please, to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, let me thank Liz Smith for bringing this important subject to members' debate. I agree with the first part of the motion it's put forward. Bus services to and from hospitals are used by a variety and often as Liz Smith, a variety of people, sorry. And as Liz Smith says, they are used by the most vulnerable in our society. Lamertshire, my area, has three major hospitals across the, the region and on occasion members of the public need to be taken to one which is not perhaps their local in order that they receive the most appropriate and expert care. For example, I had a query recently from an elderly gentleman who had been taken for emergency treatment to Hare Myers Hospital. He reports being taken to the hospital promptly and treated well by staff. However, when he recovered and was later discharged, he found it extremely difficult to get public transport back to his home in Coat Bridge. There was no available family to collect him and he eventually consigned himself to getting a taxi. While he was satisfied with the level of NHS care he received, he was worried about what someone who would not be able to afford a taxi would do in his position. So you will note that by describing this example similar to what Liz Smith had said, I am in agreement that there is an issue with transport which can affect constituents from time to time. However, I do not agree with the notion, the second part of the, the motion, um, that the Scottish Government has not taken appropriate steps to address the issue or that the Scottish Government is somehow solely responsible, although I do note that I do not think Liz Smith was entirely saying that. Yes. Mr. Bibby. I think it is fair to say that the Scottish Government have not acted appropriately. Um, since 2007, there has been no new bus legislation, and we are in danger now of having the weakest bus laws in the whole of Britain after the bus services bill at Westminster gets uh, passed. Mr. McGregor. Well, I thank the member for, um, for, for interjecting there, but if, if he lets me continue, I will uh, go on to describe how a, a local issue in Lanarkshire has been dealt with by a number of stakeholders, and I am sure that the Minister. Um, will, will sum up um, a lot of the stuff that the Scottish Government has been doing. Um, so, in, in terms of staying with my local area for a wee while, um, during the recent NHS Lanarkshire Health Care Strategy consultation, the issue of transport between hospitals for visitors and patients was raised on many occasions. In fact, I think it was one of the most um, widely uh, raised issues. Um, and for instance, in terms of the recent temporary move of orthopaedics from Monklands, a hospital has generally been agreed by all stakeholders, including NHS Lanarkshire, the Council and local representatives, that public transport services could be better and more responsible for individuals. And, uh, presiding officer, if you don't mind me digressing for just a second, um, I'd like to say that, that hopefully there will be a decision from the NHS board uh, soon on orthopaedics being permanently at the Monklands 
hospital. And I know that many have engaged with the consultation process outlining the reasons why this service should be located there um, at the new built hospital, um, funding for which has been given by the Scottish Government. Feeling in a good mood, so I'm allowing that rather <laughs> wild diversion. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, President Officer, um, for that wee detail. Um, so bearing in mind that there are many stakeholders um, involved in providing uh, transport to and from ho hospital facilities, I contacted NHS Lanarkshire uh, just yesterday um, and have been told that they are committed to the following. Firstly, continuing to work with the Strathclyde par Partnership for Transport, as mentioned by Liz Smith, to ensure that each of our sites is supported by appropriate public transport links and to also ensure transport and travel information is available quickly and easily through the creation of a transport hub. Secondly, working with the Scottish Ambulance Service to ensure that they are able to support our patients and services in providing routine as well as emergency transport. And thirdly, for those patients who are unable to access public transport but do not meet the Scottish Ambulance Service eligibility criteria for patient transport, the NHS Lanarkshire will work with the community transport sector to identify how these services can help support patients. Presiding officer, I've spent most of my time talking about a particular local issue in Lanarkshire and describing what is being proposed to address the idea, the issue of transport to hospitals. And of course, it is clear from what I've said that there is still work to be done. And that is, of course, incumbent upon all local members, councillors, MSPs and MPs of all parties to try and help resolve the issues in their areas and come up with ideas and suggestions to all the, the various stakeholders. I firmly believe that the Scottish Government has demonstrated commitment to improving transport links and enhancing partnership working between operators and transport authorities. The Government will continue to invest nearly a quarter of a billion pounds a year into the network and improve services, including around increasing passenger numbers and providing more environmentally friendly buses. There is also a desire to look at whether local transport authority powers can be further improved and what additional support and guidance might be helpful to them. To conclude, President Officer, there is no doubt that the bus services to hospital facilities can be difficult for our most vulnerable people, including those who are elderly and or disabled. I commend the launch of the, first min of the first accessible travel framework by Transport Minister Hamza Yousaf on the 29th of September 2016. I do believe this will improve the accessibility for all members of the public and strive to give everyone in our society e equal opportunity. Thanks. You could see I was thinking it was a very long conclusion. Uh, Brian Whittle, followed by Neil Bibby, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I thank uh, Liz Smith for bringing this motion to the Chamber, giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the South of Scotland area constituents, which has a large rural community. A decent, affordable public transport service accessible to all is something I'm sure all in this Chamber would agree is mandatory. Certainly, regular bus services to and from hospitals should be a given. However, that's not always the experience users of public transport are highlighting. For example, in May, uh, First Bus proposed pulling the majority of its bus services in the Borders region. In July, Scottish Borders Council approved plans to half the number of buses running between Gala Shields and Edinburgh. In April, South West Scotland Transport Partnership abandoned plans to halt several Sunday and weekday evening services in Dumfries and Galloway. However, other services were still cut and campaigners were heard to say that of stories of people wanting to go to hospital on the bus but were struggling. In 2015, the only bus linking Ayrshire's two acute hospitals with, was, was withdrawn by stagecoach, stagecoach. A doctor criticised the move, saying, I have a morning clinic at Ayr and an afternoon one at Cross House, and I don't drive. This bus is the only way I can carry out my work. When the bus was launched, it received a £20,000 a year subsidy from NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Stagecoach blamed the decreasing patronage and a further cut to the reimbursement paid to the bus operators under the Scottish Government's free concession travel, uh, transport scheme. However, it's not all doom and gloom, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, last month, a new bus service was launched in East Lothian to provide access for local shopping, hospital and doctor's appointments in the area of Harrington. Lothian County Bus 113 won Best Bus Service in Scotland at the Scottish Transport Awards in Connects East Lothian with the Edinburgh and the Western General Hospital. However, in May, First Buses proposed withdrawing from East Lothian, blaming an increasingly competitive market. But it appears Lothian buses managed to be successful in this area. What this highlights is a fairly patchy picture and approach to public bus transport coverage in the rural communities. Communities who require the same access to services as everyone else. Communities who have the same right of access to services as everyone else. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, it has already been aptly highlighted by Liz Smith and others in this debate the difficulties of the elderly, frail and sick when bus services are withdrawn. However, if I may draw the Chamber's attention to another hidden problem in cost of a reduction in public transport accessibility that leads to travel difficulties, and that is mistreatments and screenings that lead to missed opportunities to diagnose and deliver preventable treatments before the issues escalate into more serious, traumatic and, yes, costlier treatment programmes. For example, higher levels of breast cancer in rural and the most deprived areas have been directly attributed to non-attendance at routine breast cancer screening. There are other examples similar to this one. Th this is an issue exacerbated when bus public transport links are withdrawn, making attendance that much more difficult. Deputy Presiding Officer, we appreciate there is a balance between cost effectiveness and service delivery. However, these are ca there, there are cases where face value costs does not paint the full picture. Right, uh, rights to, the ac uh, to access of medical services, no matter personal circumstance, is paramount, and I would suggest it is incumbent upon the Scottish Government and this Parliament to ensure decent bu public bus transport is accessible and affordable to all, and therefore I am delighted to support this motion. Thank you. I see members are just threading other things in tenuously connected, but just in terms of the motion. It's all right. You managed to put it in. Uh, Neil Bibby to be followed by Alexander Stewart. And Mr Stewart, you'll be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Bibby. Uh, let me begin by congratulating Liz Smith for securing today's debate and for allowing us the opportunity to discuss bus services to and from our hospitals. I know from the views I've received from community representatives in Clyde Bank, for example, just how strongly people feel about the importance of having good public transport links to the new Queen Elizabeth University Hospital without a direct service. Uh, there, many people in Clyde Bank uh, find that uh, without a direct route, it can often involve ha taking free uh, buses. As the motion rightly points out, passengers travelling to hospitals can often be anxious, bereaved or distressed. Presiding officer, bus services are not a luxury that the private sector might choose to provide, but essential public services and assets of real value to the community that the travelling public cannot do without. That is why it has been so disappointing to see the scale of the decline in bus services across Scotland over these past few years. The total number uh, of journeys on Scotland's bus services has fallen to a record low. The rate of decline is 10 times higher in Scotland than across Britain as a whole. Transport Scotland's own figures show that from 2007 alone, bus journeys have fallen by 74 million. 66 million vehicle kilometres have been stripped out of the bus network over the same period. The number of buses in operation, uh, operators' fleets have dropped by 14 per cent over the last five years for which figures are available, and there has been a 5 per cent contraction in the size of the workforce in the bus industry. Instead of achieving a modal shift towards public transport, the SNP Government have presided over a decade of decline in bus services. The bus market is broken, and the SNP Government have shunned every opportunity they have had uh, been given to fix it. That is why the cutbacks referred to in uh, the Member's uh, motion come as no surprise. If we want to protect vital services to hospitals or anywhere else for that matter, then I believe we need to consider more democratic alternatives to the deregulated market. To their credit, the UK Government are doing this to some extent right now in the bus services bill. It is by no means perfect, uh, but let me be clear about that. But it is interesting that Labour, Liberal, Democrat and uh, the Conservatives now all support extending London-style bus franchising powers in England, uh, while Scotland continues to lag behind the regulatory curve. We could change that if there was the will to do so across the Parliament. And I hope Liz Smith and the Scottish Conservatives will seriously consider the case for extending uh, those powers into, into Scotland uh, as well. We could give transport authorities the power to protect services to these hospitals and decide the best way of delivering bus services in their communities. 
Uh, when confronted about bus uh, we will hear from the Minister shortly, but when confronted about uh, bus cuts in his own city, including services that bring people closer to connections with the new Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, the Transport Minister was keen to shift the blame for commercial operator service cuts to, uh, onto SPT. Of course, there are times when transport authorities need to step in, but I say to the Transport Minister that with bus cuts from one end of Glasgow to the next, his response to what is happening, I believe, in the bus industry so far has been uh, inadequate. There was no recognition of the financial pressures his government has put on SPT's members' authorities or local government across Scotland. There is no comprehension of the limitations that are placed on public transport authorities uh, when they do decide to tender for a route, and, there was, and I don't believe there's comprehension of the scale of the cutbacks uh, operators have been making to bus services across Scotland. Remember, the 66 million vehicle kilometres stripped out of the bus network come from across both commercial and subsidised routes. The public sector simply cannot afford to replace services at the rate they are being axed. So I say to the Transport uh, Minister and the Scottish Government that their position on this is untenable. The old ways will not work anymore. Something has got to change. President officer, if the main parties at Westminster can agree it's time to roll back or even replace the deregulated market, then why cannot, cannot we? Surely the time has come for action to protect vital bus services. It's time to look at alternatives to the system we, we have now that is letting passengers down. It's time for London-style bus franchising powers to come to Scotland, and it's time to put passengers and communities first. Thank you, Mr. Bibby. I call Alexander Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I note my register of interest as a serving councillor and also as the chairman of Access Cars, a patient group based at Perth Royal Infirmary? Deputy Secretary Officer, I would first of all like to pay tribute to my colleague Liv Smith for securing a debate on this most important issue uh, this afternoon. Uh, access uh, to hospital, transportation and medical clinics is a vitally important uh, source uh, within our communities. I have had a particular interest in these types of services over many years, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, in my role as a councillor within Perth and Kinross Council. Many of those who worked uh, at the hospital Perth Royal Infirmary, which is based in my uh, Perth City South Ward, regularly had to go to Nine Wells Hospital uh, in Dundee uh, as uh, part of their work uh, to have consultations, clinics or uh, even types of treatment. And prior to the establishment of the 33 bus uh, service, we had sometimes ludicrous situations uh, where from time to time medical staff, patients and even medical records were being taxied between Perth Royal Infirmary and Nine Wells Hospital because there was no link on a regular basis uh, between these two establishments. Moreover, Deputy Presiding Officer, time and again my council constituents told me that having to go to an appointment uh, from uh, a location within Perth, it could mean changing three different buses to get to an appointment and then having to get three different buses back home. So for an elderly or a disabled person, it could mean that a half-hour consultation would take up their whole day and consume their whole day. The reality is, Deputy Presiding Officer, that non-drivers face equally challenging experiences to get to hospital, as do younger, non-disabled, non-benefit patients who usually have to fund these trips for themselves. It isn't just outpatient appointments that cause the problem. If admitted to hospital, it may well be the case that it's impossible for individuals to visit evenings uh, and weekends uh, because of the bus service being so erratic uh, and there was not an opportunity for this to take place. An example of one of my constituents and her husband, who are both non-drivers, wanted to visit their son, uh, which meant relying on a family member uh, and doing an 80-mile round trip each night uh, and each day to ensure that they could visit him in the hospital. If they didn't do that, they had the opportunity to maybe stay at a local hotel, which could have cost them up to £100 for that uh, itself. So over the course of many years, I have fought regularly and always to ensure that we would have some kind of transportation between the two facilities in Perth uh, and in Nine Wells. But Deputy President Officer, it took eight years for that to become a reality. I could not believe that year on year I kept going back and asking the same questions. Where could we get the funding? It was obvious that there was an opportunity, yep. but it didn't happen. But eight years of myself fighting with others in the council, it was achieved. And I do pay tribute to a fellow councillor, Councillor Willie Wilson, who did manage to uh, secure uh, with me that, that service. 
We achieved the support across the political spectrum, together with Stagecoach Group and also NHS Tayside. And the bus service materialised and Route 30, 333 became a considerable achievement and an outstanding success. Yep. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, I was extremely disappointed when the decision was taken to replace this dedicated hospital shuttle with the new X7 service between Perth and Aberdeen. Stagecoach have reported an increase in uptake in the new route, but neglect to point out that it's because of the different dynamics within the individuals who are using that transport, and that it sometimes has a conflict with individuals who are uh, hospital users. As Liz Smith has pointed out, there are a myriad of problems that occur within the service. The inability uh, for the accessibility uh, within the location, the double-decker coaches uh, themselves ha have little seating on the lower deck, uh, and there is not even a dedicated ramp for individuals to use between the journey. So it's not really a, a, a suitable bus service for individuals who have ailments and want to go to hospital. Deputy Prime Minister, all of these factors once again highlight the need to have dedicated services going back and forward. And if we have them, they are used. You know, we have difficulties in parking around hospitals. Yep. But if you have a dedicated bus service, that relieves the pressure on the parking around a hospital. That is not rocket science. That is just genuine reality. Yeah. And it should be being managed on a daily basis across our, our sector. It has become clear from listening across the chamber today that the debate that, that we do have communities across Scotland that are facing exactly the same uh, potential problems and they have to be recognised. So I'm pleased that there's been some consensus around the issues in the Chamber. It's clear that there's a general desire to support the continued uh, uh, hospital network and transforming Scotland. And I would say that we need to look at transporting uh, transport schemes across Scotland. And if that can be achieved, then we'll go some way to do that. And I do believe and I hope that the Scottish Government take that on board. So therefore, Deputy Prime Minister, Officer, and in conclusion, I'm delighted to have taken part in this and I very much pay tribute to Liz Smith for bringing this to the Chamber today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I'm nodding about difficulties in parking at hospitals. I think we all know about that. Uh, I now call on the Minister, Hamza Yusuf, to wind up the government. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I want to start by thanking Liz Smith for securing debate and for uh, what I thought uh, were, were very good contributions, uh, by and large, uh, around the Chamber. I also want to thank her for the tone in which she uh, made her, her remarks. I, I think everybody here has highlighted problems locally and issues locally uh, which absolutely go to the very hearts of their communities. I've been in this post now for uh, about six months and um, all I have to do is look at my Twitter feed at any time of the day, morning, afternoon or evening to see how uh, emotive people get about their transport. And I don't mean that uh, in a negative way uh, at all. Uh, transport is emotional. It's what connects you to your family, to your communities. Uh, it's what uh, connects your businesses with other businesses. It's what helps to get your staff in or deliveries to be made. Uh, or indeed uh, is the difference between making that hospital appointment or GP surgery appointment uh, or not. And as uh, Brian Whittle uh, said uh, quite rightly, uh, can have uh, effects for longer term health conditions, uh, if not uh, uh, preventative. Uh, uh, so I, I think points are, are well made uh, in that regard. And I don't take that uh, responsibility lightly uh, at all. It's a, a huge issue uh, for me. I want to try to spend the time um, focusing on some of the, the issues that were raised directly uh, by members. Before I do that, I'll, I'll just put on, for the sake of the record, of course, the support that the, the Scottish Government gives uh, to, to the bus uh, industry. Many have referred to uh, the BSOG uh, grant, uh, £50 million a year. Of course, we're coming into that spending uh, review period. Uh, and I felt uh, the uh, strength uh, uh, of feeling on this from uh, bus operators, of course, but also from members here about uh, the importance uh, of that uh, subsidy, but also, of course, uh, the £212 uh, million pounds of funding that we provide uh, for free bus travel for disabled uh, and older people, which I hope uh, people, uh, members across the chamber would recognise, promote social inclusion and has had those substantial health benefits uh, in getting people to their uh, hospitals and GP appointments uh, through the, uh, the years. Uh, now to address some of the, the, the issues that were raised and I think well raised uh, by, by members, particularly the bus services mentioned in the motion, uh, if I may, I thought uh, Liz Smith made a very important point uh, about the X7 service, uh, particularly in terms of accessibility. Uh, I launched the accessible travel framework, which I think was mentioned by uh, uh, Gregor Fulton and perhaps other members uh, as well. And I was genuinely uh, astounded at some of the stories I heard from uh, those using public transport. And I think we've come a long way, I've got no doubt, 
uh, about that. And there is legislation about low flooring, uh, of course, as, as the member will be aware on, on single deck and double decker buses. But still in 2016, uh, some of the challenges people were facing with disabilities uh, using our public transport for me was, was simply unacceptable. So the, the, the first uh, uh, accessible travel framework, uh, which was developed by people with disabilities and will be monitored throughout that 10 year lifetime uh, by those with disabilities, I think is a huge step forward. I, yes, I will, in just one second. This, the X, the X7 I point uh, that I just want to make is that I'm, I'm aware that Stagecoach is aware of the issues that she's raised. They're working now with Max, our uh, mobility access uh, committee, uh, and uh, indeed with passengers with disabilities to see how they can retrofit uh, some of their fleet uh, of buses and coaches to make improvements. But of course, I'll let Liz Smith in. Uh, I, Liz I'm, Smith. I'm very grateful to the minister, uh, and I totally accept uh, what he's saying there. I think it's, it's very important. Uh, the other issue, which I know is not a direct responsibility of the government, but I think it, it, government influence would be helpful, is when it comes to the practicalities of getting much larger buses into hospitals. And to take up the point that my colleague Alexander Stewart raised about the parking issue, if the bus physically can't get in uh, to the hospital area, that is a serious issue for many people. I just wonder if the minister uh, could encourage uh, those who uh, are obviously providing the bus services when he has his talks. To Think about that. Minister. Yes, I will, I will certainly endeavour to do that. And I think, uh, you know, you touched upon a very important point about planning and transport working closer together. We have, of course, uh, as you'll be aware, government preparing a uh, consultation paper uh, on planning and the planning review. Uh, that will be a, a, an endeavour that we all across government will look to input into. And me as Transport Minister, that's something I think I should uh, feed uh, back into, uh, into that uh, discussion. Uh, on the, uh, the, the services affecting Aberdeen, which I mentioned, uh, I should say I've, I've spoken to a number of councillors just yesterday, a meeting with Councillor Willie Young uh, from Aberdeen uh, City Council uh, uh, on those services. And on the services in Glasgow, she'll, she'll, she'll know that I'm well, well uh, aware of that uh, the, the services to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital that Neil Bibby touched upon, uh, I'm well aware of uh, and uh, have made representations uh, to first uh, in particular about those. Should be said, the Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital, I would say, is well served by, by bus routes. Uh, you know, 60 buses an hour uh, coming in and out of that hospital. Uh, where they can go further on that, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with bus companies. I want to try to touch upon some of what uh, Neil Bibby uh, had discussed and perhaps the wider issues and challenges we face. Uh, on our buses, there, is, there has been a decrease and decline in, 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 in patronage uh, on the buses from, if you'd listen to Neil Bibby's uh, remarks, you'd think they started with the SNP government. Just to give you some context, they absolutely haven't. Uh, they started, no, I'll let you in in a second. Uh, they started in 1960. And in fact, the worst decline, 1,664 million passengers in 1960 through to 860 million passengers in 1970. That was the steepest decline, of course, when the buses were regulated. Uh, so this is not an issue of simply bus ownership. Um, but what I would say to the member is that uh, that decline has been the worst in Glasgow and the West. Now that's not to shift the blame to SPT. I hope I haven't given that impression in, in the remarks. Uh, and it's not to shift the blame even to Glasgow City Council or North Lanarkshire or South Lanarkshire Council. This is an issue we all have to do with, whether it's national government, whether it's councils or whether it's regional transport partnerships. Uh, the silver bullet is not suddenly regulating the buses, but let me give him some sort of reassurances, if I can. Uh, on the, uh, in our manifesto, uh, we committed to a transport bill. We'll bring that transport bill forward, and there will be, as I have already said, I think to the member and probably uh, on the public record, that there will be a bus element to that bill. I will be looking forward to hearing his submissions uh, on this. But the biggest issue that the bus operators tell me is not necessarily the ownership of the buses, though I will happily explore his idea of local franchising, uh, as he discussed. Uh, or indeed uh, other models, uh, but actually an issue of, for example, congestion. Uh, if it takes 50% longer for a bus to go through Glasgow than it did as many years ago, then clearly there's an issue why buses are becoming less reliable and therefore less popular. Um, so there's issues there for us all to tackle. I'm more than willing and I am uh, committed to absolutely tackling the issue uh, of reliability and declining patronage. I want to see an upward trend in patronage uh, on the buses, so I'll do everything I can. In terms of community transport, and I'll end on this point, um, presiding officer, that uh, was mentioned uh, by some of the members uh, here. When it comes to community transport, uh, I see the real value on it. In terms of extending the, the, the travel, the concessionary travel scheme, there's real difficulties with that because the majority of community transport is done, for example, by private cars. Uh, and therefore, there's a difficulty in extending uh, that, that, that scheme as well as the obvious um, budgetary uh, pressures, but I'm willing to see how I can support community transport. For example, most recently I announced 
uh, that uh, for the minibuses, uh, th th those community transport uh, initiatives that rely on minibuses, uh, one of the biggest barriers seems to be the prohibitive cost uh, of getting a minibus licence. So we've committed to, to put some money and a fund towards helping community transport uh, to get those uh, minibus licences. So uh, in conclusion, uh, presiding uh, officer, uh, yes, I'm, uh, I commend, of course, Liz Smith for bringing this uh, motion uh, to the Parliament. I'll certainly work with members across the Chamber to see how we can ensure that our tra public transport buses and otherwise uh, work for the people of Scotland, but in particular for those with, uh, that, that, uh, that have uh, vulnerabilities and simply want to get to their doctors, uh, surgeries, uh, their clinics or indeed their hospitals. And I think all of us have a duty to ensure uh, all the people of Scotland can, get, uh, can, 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 can access public transport regardless of their ability uh, or indeed their postcode. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes the debate. And I now suspend this meeting until 2.30. Thank you.